<clears throat> We're listening to Schubert and the Musik first. Wow. I'm waiting for a few more people to join us. This is Schubert, sung by Dietrich Fischer Dieskau. I feel free to share this. What I will do is I will just discuss a few questions I received on the course, which starts next week. And then I'll also read a passage from Nietzsche's Gay Science in the fourth book on leisure and idleness, Muse und Musigang. So that will be the live stream. And I'll also read a bit of Heidegger from the country path walks so let's begin for anyone who doesn't know I'll, I'm teaching an online course on idleness with dignity or leisure as the basis of civilization which covers Plato and Aristotle Cicero Bertrand Russell, Nietzsche, Wilhelm von Humboldt, Heidegger. And we'll start next week on Saturday. So there's two levels to this. There are video lectures, which are accessible through teachable.com. The link you'll find below, you have to sign up for the second tier if you'd like to participate in the seminars as well. So the seminars will start next week, Saturday, and will run for seven weeks, seven consecutive Saturdays of group seminars. The seminars are a space for otium cum dignitate. There's something I found interesting. Some people are very open to this new form of teaching and self-study, which is completely which is completely independent from getting a degree. And in that sense, is non-instrumental. And then there are others. There was one person last week who asked during the first live stream where I introduced the course, someone asked, but how will we be evaluated? How do we get feedback? Now, feedback is an interesting word because feedback comes from cybernetics. So students are very used to at this point they seem to be very used to getting feedback a positive feedback loop right you 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 give your meager nine thousand pounds a year and you get the positive feedback of the average mark which is a 65 in the uk everyone's basically a 65 at this point with great inflation everyone is a 2-1 everyone's a b minus if you like in american terms and that takes away to some degree what education, building, self-formation is about, I would think. So what I'm providing, what I'm giving with these seminars is a very open space confined within two hours of pure otium cum dignitate, leisure with dignity, where the only thing that matters is one's own self-development so there is no formal feedback given i'm there to guide the seminars i'm there to facilitate discussion i'm there to come back to the original text and so there are responses there are in the proper sense these are dialogues conversations in which not not too dissimilar from perhaps from 
the original from the Lyceum of Aristotle, one of the schools that existed for quite some time, and so did Plato's Academy. One of the methods, and by the way, method means methodos, means path. That's what method means, right? Hodos means path towards the path. The peripatos is a walking, is a taking a walk together in thought, in thinking. And such will be the seminars also. I actually received a wonderful email from someone who signed up, who said that he's absolutely excited to be participating in the course because he finds the material very helpful. As I increase my engagement with philosophy and with thinking, something I've desperately searched for and not found in academia for several years. The non-technological essence of technology seems to be at work in academia. So, yeah, the, the idea is here that, weirdly enough, by using market logic and its instrumental rationality to offer these courses, what they then, what these seminars then offer or allow for is the exact opposite, is that instrumental rationality has got no room, no space within those seminars whatsoever. It's actually about, it's completely non-instrumental. You won't get a degree, you won't get a certificate, but what you will earn at best, of course, is a profound reading of these profound texts, which come back to the most important question, which is why is it that Plato in the Cretius dialogue says that skole, the, the Greek word for leisure, is what arrives in Athens when Athens finally, when the Athenians finally direct their news, their sense, and their logos, their conversations to skole itself, skole to, to, and to the plenty, to the full, rather than to lack. And in that sense, leisure becomes the basis of civilization, the basis of culture. So the slogan is otium cum dignitate, and we're granting a space for this. And I would like to read now a wonderful passage, which will also be discussed in the seminars in great length, at great length and great detail. This is Nietzsche from the Gay Science, section 329 in the fourth book, which is entitled Sanctus Januarius, Holy January. So he says that there's something peculiar about the American spirit. And then he goes on to say the ferocity, uh, the, the breathless haste, sorry, with which they work, the distinctive vice of the new world. So he calls this haste in working, the distinctive vice that which makes a vicious, um, the a vicious aspect of the new world is exactly this haste in working. And that's already beginning to infect old Europe with its ferocity and is spreading a lack of spirituality like a blanket. So we begin to become geistlos. We lack spirit. Even now, one is ashamed of resting. And prolonged reflection almost gives people a bad conscience. One thinks with a watch in one's hand, even as one eats one's midday meal while reading the latest news of the stock market. One lives as if one always might miss out on something, rather do anything than nothing. This principle, too, is merely a string to throttle all culture and good taste. Just as all forms are visibly perishing by the haste of the workers, the feeling for form itself, the ear and eye for the melody of movements are also perishing. The proof of this may be found in the universal demand for gross obviousness in all those situations in which human beings wish to be honest with one another for once, in their associations with friends, women, relatives, children, teachers, pupils, leaders, and princes. One no longer has time or energy for ceremony, for being obliging in an indirect way, for esprit in conversation, and for any otium at all, there is no more time. Living in a constant chase after gain, 
or after credit points and after marks and after being evaluated by the machine. Living in this constant chase compels people to expend their spirit to the point of exhaustion in continual pretense and overreaching and anticipating others. Virtue has come to consist of doing something in less time than someone else. Hours in which honesty is permitted have become rare. And when they arrive, one is tired and does only want to let oneself go, but actually wishes to stretch out as long and wide and ungainly as one happens to be. This is how people now write letters. And of course, no one writes letters anymore. And the style and the spirit of letters will always be the true sign of the times. It might be interesting to point out, for example, that the word to relax comes, is, is a word of the Industrial Revolution. And so what the, the seminars will do is we will take Nietzsche very seriously here and consider his remarks that there's no longer any otium, that there is no longer any esprit in conversation. So we will do our best to find esprit in conversation because there is not, what's not at stake is trying to overpower anyone else who's in the room, but rather to try and make sense of the texts that we read in a way that is entirely suspended from the ordinary demands of the machine. We'll also consider some of the unpublished notebooks by Nietzsche, the texts of the unpublished notebooks, which are one of one of them in one of them he speaks of an uncanny wheel work. I think I've I think I've mentioned this before, but Nietzsche is very clear that the history of the next 200 years, and he writes in the, in the eight, 1870s, I think, or 1880s, that the history for the next 200 years will be this uncanny wheel work of ever more finely adapted wheels that have to fit in, right? And this is exactly this, the notion of feedback and being evaluated is exactly this. So students that require a permanent feedback, which basically always evens out at somewhere around the median, um, the, this feedback loop is exactly this uncanny wheel work of ever more finely adapted wheels. Because a wheel can ever more finely self-adapt by being continuously evaluated and self-evaluating to see where it supposedly objectively stands within this uncanny machinery. And that's perhaps where the educational industry is at this point. Which, um, which is rather sad. One of the other thinkers we'll consider is Wilhelm von Humboldt, who was a, a Prussian bureaucrat, basically. But Humboldt came, you know, Humboldt and others, Schleiermacher at the time too, and Fichte had the magnificent idea that the university should serve now finally only to teach as a place to, to teach philosophy. And Humboldt said something very interesting. I will also consider, which is the university, it, this is a quote from him, taking seminars is a minor matter. What really matters is to be in a lonely, a healthy loneliness, and by a self-actus, so he uses the word in German, selbstactus, self-act. The, the self acting out of itself considers itself to be worthy and finding a certain urge, a genuine drive to intellectual fulfillment and the need to focus. What's more important than taking seminars is that you find peers with whom to share this healthy loneliness and teachers in best, in the, in the best scenario are not dogmats who this is what Heidegger also says, right? T teaching, and every teacher knows this, that the teacher learns because the teacher does not preach, the teacher doesn't give a dogma, and certainly doesn't use PowerPoint presentations, as I keep telling, because they're making us use PowerPoint now at some university I might be at or not. Um, 
I said to students, if you use PowerPoint, just stay home. Just stay home. Save the 9,000 pounds. Read Wikipedia. It's much more efficient. Why, why even come? Why even go to university? There's no point whatsoever to go to university that teaches the same course every year with the same material every year. Maybe some minor details change because student complained that it was too difficult. It was, I didn't understand everything and the, the, the customer is always right. So that's getting, getting adapted. So the profound question really is what will education, proper education look like? And I don't mean the education that you pay for in order to get a degree, in order to get a certificate for the workplace. And with whatever situation we're in now, it's questionable anyways, what the world of work will look like likely after this. And I quote Queen Elizabeth again. She said at her address to the nation last Sunday with her incredible self-discipline that this woman has, she said, this is a time to slow down. So let's take this time and slow down and apply ourselves, devote ourselves to finding genuine access to meaning, which is what, what happens when you read philosophy profoundly without having the pressure of being evaluated. I had a wonderful teacher in Italy. His name is Ivo De Cinaro. And he once taught a course where he said, I, how would I be able to, this was on Nietzsche, and he said, how would I be able to evaluate whether you understood the eternal recurrence of the same or you didn't? This profound thought of Nietzsche, which might be how time works for us now, which could be the heaviest weight, which pulls us down back onto the earth in order to give us a sense of grounding and sense again. So in, in Italy, the highest mark is 30, 30 or 30 con lode, 30 with, with appraisal. And Ivo Di Cinaro gave us all a, a 30 con laude, a 30 con laude, all four of us who were, who were still left at the course and, and at the end. Because of course you cannot, so, oh, you've understood Nietzsche's eternal recurrence, 27.5. And, and you've understood uh, you've understood it 29, right? It's so meaningless that it's it's almost painful that that everything is like this. This book I recently read something on on Amazon of all places uh, on Aristotle's uh, Perites Psychias on the soul, de anima. This ground foundational book of true psychology, not not this fake psychology we've had for 70 years. I don't know the true psychology. That that's a, an, an ancient science. And, and someone wrote that, um, gave a one-star review and said, it's it, he's now more confused, the poor soul, than before. It, it actually made him wonder that that was in, in the, that was in the evaluation. It said, this book made me wonder more and didn't answer my questions. And so, the, but, you know, to, this is quite striking that someone would say this about the philosopher who said that the beginning of philosophy itself is thomatsein, hmm? to sense wonder and then ask, oh, well, why, why is there something rather than nothing? Now, so it's a space, these seven weeks also for returning to this sense of wonder because philosophy, everything is a burden. Right? Studying is a burden very often, and then you have to do an exam that you don't want to sit through, and you have to write an essay in a certain format, and if you don't write it in that certain format, you will get crowded out. So it's a very strange epoch to be in, because everything, even, even down to philosophy, it's basically homogenized in a very strange way that I We'll have to think about more in order to make uh, more sense of it. But so anyone who's just joined in, there's a link down there to the idleness with dignity course. The there's two different versions you can choose from. One is that you get just the course content, which is seven lectures on the questions, seven video lectures plus audio, plus the PDF. So you get essays with that too. And then of course there's the possibility also to sign up for the seminars. So we'll have seven weeks of seminars, seven consecutive weeks, and there should be a coupon or some sort of, sort of a code down there as well where you type in idler50 and that gives you 50% off 
the course for now. There's a couple of those um, of those coupons left. Yes, like music. Yeah, mu music. So very important. The point on music is very, very important indeed, because what we so right. You know, we, we think of um, we we must consider silence as as the origin of music. I'm going to read a quote to you. Thank you for pointing this out. By the Russian pianist Valery Afanasyev. I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. Now he says this, nowadays silence has become a rare phenomenon that is energetically set upon by various machines, machine guns, and the twittering of human voices. Silence is out of our reach because we have forgotten how to listen to it. As if brushing silence aside, we fill in the pause, the, the pauses that turn up here and there. Silence withdraws into itself, punishing us for our nonchalant scorn. The instrumentalists who opt for fast tempos seem to apprehend the absence of notes. All the time they move their fingers or vocal cords to sidestep the chasms at the bottom of which there lies the source of music, its eternal mystery. I often say that silence is the foundation of music. Recently, I found a similar thought in the work of the writer who remains However, beyond the scope of my usual readings, François Mauriac, I was not surprised in the least. My idea is perfectly banal. I am rather surprised that musicians do not express do not express it in every interview. All you have to do is guard against any noise without stopping to listen to yourself and the world. And gradually, music comes into existence. So music from silence, music from music from 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 stillness and thinking thought itself from stillness thought itself and the calm and the stillness which we're now for for a change enjoying right for a change the world is at rest there's something i also want to just briefly touch upon which is that one of the godfathers of modernity is Francis Bacon. And I mentioned this last week already, but there might be people here who weren't here last week. And he has a very esoteric text. I, th I think I should make a video on this text just now, uh, in, in, in a couple of weeks, which, where he, which is entitled The New Atlantis. Atlantis sank because they, because they fell for hubris. Atlantis sank because... They never stood still. The harbor of Atlantis never stood still. They knew no silence. They knew no calmness. And hence, they went mad, as Plato tells us. So I find it striking that the godfather of modernity does not speak of a new Athens, but rather of a new Atlantis, whose ultimate history we all know, it sank. It sank and disappeared, and he hopes, of course, for it to come back in, in a in a great uh, rejuvenation. And he speaks of weirdly enough of what we now, would now refer to as skyscrapers and airplanes. It's a very fascinating text to read, but I'm calling, and I say it again as I did last week, I'm calling for a new Athens, a new Garden of Athens, rather than a new Atlantis. May it sink once and for all. We need a new Athens. And we need to be. We need to learn how to be still again. How to find calm and peace for there to be, as Nietzsche says, esprit in conversation, esprit in conversation. And this is why I prefer the word idler in idleness to leisure, because leisure comes from Latin licere, where you get the English word license from. So it's it's through the French lezir which also means to be allowed to. Right. But I wouldn't want us to ask to be allowed to do something. I would rather want to be in a situation where we are suspended from these fake pressures of the uncanny wheel work, which requires us to evaluate ourselves and everything 
think about this. Think think about how weird this age is. Because now for once, we can't walk around like madmen evaluating everything all the time. I mean, we're still doing it on Twitter and all these other things where you can give hearts and blah, blah, blah. But still, hearts and likes that aren't hearts and not proper likes either. But usually, anywhere you go, anything you order, anything you buy, you're asked immediately to feed back an evaluation. This is what the cybernetic uncanny machinery requires. It requires this will to will that wills itself because it wills itself. It requires constant evaluation. It's so insecure, this machinery, that it always has to look around like the all-seeing eye that doesn't see anything, never sees anything of the heart, and looks around and looks, 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 looks nervously. And then it needs to be evaluated, evaluated. And it needs to spill, spit out these evaluations all over the place, right? And then when you lie on your deathbed, you can say, I had a 65 on my Hume essay in university score. No, you've, learning is something else and studying is also something else. And also coming into a place of true studying is something else. Now, <laughs> Yes, Joshua, you may just email me, okay? Um, so the the um, the it's this this machinery wants us to evaluate everything all the time, including ourselves. It needs this. It feeds on these positive feedback loops. It requires those. But one of the questions that many people ask is, how do you break the machine? How do you get out? Well, by not playing its game. You can't will for it to end. If you will for it to end, you're 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 just leaning into. You actually you're tapping into this this drive of modernity to control everything. You're trying to control that which controls. So the 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 released response and the 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 one of the lectures, one of the later lectures will be on Heidegger, on releasement, which is a letting go and allowing to occur because that's what breaks the will. Hmm? So I'm reading from the conversation on a country path where a teacher, a scholar, and a scientist converse. So releasement, the scientist says, Releasement is effected from somewhere else. And then the teacher says, no, not effected, but let in. The scholar says, to be sure, I don't know yet what the word releasement means, but I seem to presage that releasement. Awakens when our nature is let in so as to have dealings with that which is not a willing. And then the scientist says, you speak without let up of a letting be and give the impression that what is meant is a kind of passivity. All the same, I think I understand that it is in no way a matter of weakly allowing things to slide and drift along. Scholar, perhaps a higher acting is concealed in releasement, gelassenheit is the German, than is found in all the actions within the world and in the machinations of all mankind. And the teacher says, which higher acting is yet no activity. So Heidegger wants to understand Gelassenheit, releasement, well beyond, well beyond the active passive distinction. So it's quite um, important to see that Gelassenheit is not just a quietistic passive stance, nor is it this overly active, you know, the, 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 the willful, the man who makes himself and, and makes the world in, in his image or what, what he wants it to be. No, Gelassenheit is a stance that, that we let in to ourselves and that then allows us to let go and let roll. And then it becomes almost like playing with the forces that are at work. And some of the things that you can just be, that one can just begin to perhaps appreciate is that we do not, we, we are maybe observed and watched by this all-seeing eye, but the all-seeing eye does not see. And it doesn't see also because it's it's restless. There's another video I will make shortly on Hegel's The End of Art. And I find it quite striking what he has to say about irony. I will talk about irony there too, because we many the, the ironic stance is very much the 
the postmodern stance. And the ironic stance is the self-disclosed subject, the self-disclosed I, um, who is completely, uh, which is completely, um, uh, which is very, um, so the, 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 the I is self, con is, is only concerned with itself, but only with its own substantiality, with an abstract formal empty I. And this abstract empty formal I then longs to get back out into the world. And that's perhaps also what's at work in, in, the, in the late modern subjectivity that never comes to rest, that never finds rest, right? That even that, that, that there's a certain heaviness even about this, the busyness. And that's what many, peop many people really talk about. Joseph Pieper talks about this completely independently from Heidegger. And instead of coming to, instead of coming to understand and appreciate that boredom, what, that, that boredom is for Heidegger is the fundamental mood attunement of our epoch. This attunement, this attunement is what we need to, I think, tap into. We need to tap into this attunement of genuine boredom because where the machine wants us is actually bored because this boredom is what it, what it, what it, what it thrives on. Hmm? It needs us bored so that we can briefly be distracted and then be, be until this distraction, this desire again shows itself not to be fulfilling because the empty subject is only circling around itself and it never comes out into the world. And that's, where the machinery wants us, which is why also this entire being locked in situation is, is quite nefarious because it, it seems like Gestell is kind of reinforcing itself. And so that's a bit dangerous, perhaps. I, I don't know what helps, maybe a, a glass of red wine sometimes and switching off. But I think genuinely that it's also a situation of a return to this profound understanding of Skole. And my, my teacher, Evita Gennaro, says that, that Skole is the most important question. The, the question of Skole, so the Greek word for leisure or idleness. And very often, so Skole, by the way, is the original word for school, right? That's what, it, that's what it means, it's school. That's where the word school comes from. So a school should be a place often for and out of Skole. And this is what I'm building. This is what I'm building. That's that's the Halkion Academy. So I've founded the Halkion Thinkers Guild, which takes the origin of the university, the Università Universita di, di Bologna was founded from a guild of scholars who needed a physical space. I founded a guild in a non-physical space online with the aspiration to get either enough people signed up over the years or get patronage or both of this so then have a physical space as well in some cities around the world where there is idle teaching in this proper sense we don't we simply where people simply come in order to be in touch again with the teachings of plato Aristotle, the pre-Socratics, and or the other philosophers that we might consider. Now, and that's why I'm calling for a new Athens rather than a new Atlantis. And so while in this period, the Gestell is you know, rearranging itself and becoming more anti-fragile and finding, finding ways of reinforcing itself, it's also perhaps uh, uh, in this moment of uncertainty which is which is just obvious that it's, it's a moment of uncertainty it's also a time really to begin to build to begin to build towards something that wouldn't have been possible even just a couple of weeks ago and so yes that's so while you're here i mean this is pioneering right i'm trying to be pioneering here and anyone who's joining in is pioneering with me one of the things i will very much encourage is that you stay in touch throughout these seven weeks and beyond the seven weeks 
something with the, the, the Justin Murphy and LG, we did, we taught a course on Deleuze and Heidegger on technology. We finished a couple of weeks ago. We will have some of our students who want to on our channels, either on Justin's or my channel, to give a live presentation on one of the you know ideas that they've developed throughout or during the course. And so I'm seeing now that more people have, uh, have, have just joined, I'm just mentioning it again, that I'm teaching a course on idleness with dignity or leisure as the basis of culture. There's a link down there to teachable.com where you can sign up. There should also be a coupon. You get 50% off until, I think until today or tomorrow that that'll be live, that coupon. And so if you sign up for the seminars, you can join for seven weeks for seven seminars, seven two-hour seminars. We will meet over Zoom. So you need to have Zoom for that. And it's 6 p.m. UK time, which I think is, is good for even people in the, on the West side in, in the US. And yeah, we'll start next week, April 18th. I'm very much looking forward to it. And it'll be a, so we'll have, you know, breakout rooms where people then meet up in, in separate Zoom groups and then come back to the main group and discuss their ideas. And I think... Joshua, who's, he might still be here. Um, if Joshua is still alive, he was actually in the Deleuze course. So um, I think he enjoyed it quite a bit. I think I, I think that's fair to say. And I enjoyed very much Joshua's, um, Joshua's comments and his ideas. And you learn a lot as a, you know, when there's no anxiety in the room, whether you're good enough in, in the eyes of the, the teacher who may judge or evaluate you because it's it's about something else uh, the the academy of plato that he founded existed for hundreds of years why because first of all they all disagreed with plato <laughs> that's first of all just like aristotle one of the students of plato disagreed with him and it was a continuous dialogue a continuous dancing around the logos and so joshua just says it's very rewarding well, it's. I think. I think it was for for many who attended the the Deleuze and Heidegger course. I think it was rewarding also on just because you 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 know what kind of this I, online existence can be very lonely, but this is also where you you know you you figure out that there are there might be one or two other people who have similar inclinations. And let let's also be clear, right? This is a time where it's it's a, like almost like a Titanic battle where the world will be different afterwards, but let's hope it won't be the Amazon, let's order everything online world and, and be consumer bucks trapped in a pot underneath the earth somewhere. But no, let's, let, let's think ahead and also reflect back on what has been coming towards a different horizon and also, <laughs> and also trying to... Um, by the way, anyone who's watching the replay of this, the reason I'm looking over there, I'm looking sometimes at the at the comments. So um, that, that might be a bit disturbing for anyone who watches this afterwards. But yes, so that's that. So it would be great to see as many of you as possible at the at the seminars or sign up for the course content, if if only just just that. Which so it's seven lectures all in. I think lectures in on average are thirty minutes long on average. And there will be, there's one essay for each of them. And maybe I should just mention my credentials. Um, I do have a PhD in philosophy that I'm, yes, that I suffered for for many years. I wrote my PhD thesis on Heidegger on death at the University of Warwick. I teach philosophy at the, Uni not Birkbeck College, University of London. And I actually was five years ago, a very wonderful time in my life. I was a research fellow at the leisure project at the University of Freiburg for six months. So I've, I've considerably, um, and actually the, so the, the course is based on a paper that I've, that I wrote for the International Yearbook of Hermeneutics on Ocean Cum Dignitate, on Idleness with Dignity, on these thinkers. That's what the course is based on. So it's a peer reviewed paper. And I've also been uh, involved with Tom Hodgkinson here in the UK, who's the original idler of the past 25 years. 
he actually gave me a stage for the first time. It was about six years ago when I came to London. Uh, and he, he let me teach a course on, on Nietzsche, on Amor Fati, when I was an MA student. But he put his faith in me, which is really wonderful. Um, which is also, I think, what, what idleness is about to some degree, right? It's this laissez-faire uh, approach to existence and not being too focused on... And this is something I like about the British people in general, is that if you've got something to say in a perhaps a bit of an eccentric way, then they will celebrate you rather than uh, drive you out the village. Um, so yes, my friend James just... Uh, left a comment, he will be joining in as well. He was also, I think, in the Deleuze Heidegger course. He could only make it to one of the seminars because he was busy with other things before he was traveling. But um, I think, Joshua, you made it to every single seminar, if I remember correctly. And yeah, those were good seminars, but this will be even more intense because we'll have seven weeks, which is almost a full semester in the UK. And so, yeah, if you want to sign up do it today or tomorrow that's as long as the the coupon will be valid and again the thing is considered will be plato and aristotle we will also talk about something that's that's quite significant i think with aristotle what happens i should have mentioned this before perhaps aristotle i think i think in aristotle there's something quite because the way we think of leisure is that we need unleisure in order to have leisure. So we need to work in order to be at leisure. And this dialectic begins with Aristotle. So one of the thing, one of the aspects I'm trying to work, uh, one of the trajectories I'm trying to work out is that trajectory from Aristotle all the way up to Marx to today, which is that once we have finally solved the problem of work, then we can be at leisure. And I'm trying to argue for the exact opposite. I'm trying to argue for the stance of Skole, for the stance of idleness that one takes, which is which is an inner stance, a way of being, which then allows one to be at peace, calm and calm and calmly in the world, so that one's one's deeds, one's 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 once being in the world just flows from oneself and it comes to one in a you see almost in, in a divine manner in a, in a god-like manner such that you are in touch with these with the ether not in any kind of even the the toughest tasks come to you easily and they are necessarily be executed this is Perhaps also a course I would think for creative types who are looking for inspiration and ways of being that could then, you know, help them to develop further uh, their art and how they are creative, right? Because I think what's stifling creativity to a large degree is is the notion of work. Is that it, it's it's work that must be done. This is also why I'm rather critical of the contemporary state of the humanities or of the universities, perhaps in general. That the the mentality of publish or perish, and you have to publish, or it's very violent when you think about it, or you literally die, right? So this is perhaps not the best uh, not the best scenario in order to be to be coming into thought as if you, you cannot force thought to come and if you do though then perhaps you're not really thinking so with this in mind i'm inviting you to seven saturdays of otium cum dignitate of idleness with dignity and i very much hope you can all make it. You will find the link just down there to teachable.com where using the coupon, you get the 50% off to a seven week period of idleness with dignity. And so I wish you all the best on this uh, weekend. Please stay well. 
and see you next week. Ciao.